Hey guys, welcome back. It's kind of occurring to me that I probably should have done something with my hair. Oh well. So, it's time to actually start talking about content. So, um, I'm just going to use the video I made last semester of me talking about the introduction to the book. Um, it's mostly a lot of questions. Um, and I, I don't think there's anything I need to like pop in and update about, but if I notice anything, just be looking for me, future Ellie. No, I, I, that was dumb. I should probably cut that. Uh, anyway, um, please do forgive my microphone. I hadn't acquired a, this fancy new beautiful microphone yet. And uh, yeah, take it away, past Ellie. <laughs> First things first, the definition of punishment that we're actually going to be using for the class. This book uses a four-part definition of punishment. So one thing you must take away from this reading is what do those four parts mean? Some of them are kind of similar. Why are they each different and their own separate thing? And why are they each important? How are they limiting the scope of our discussion and why? Why are we focusing on punishment that fits these criteria rather than other types? Um, as a hint, my focus is on law and how that impacts people. Okay, the author goes into those in more detail, so look through that and figure out why. Um, the next thing that we start to get a little introduction on is the idea of the aim and distribution of punishment. <clears throat> Aim means why? What's the goal? What's the purpose? Why are we bothering to punish these people? So whereas aim is the why, distribution is more whom? Whom do we punish? How do we choose between them? How do we distinguish, distinguish who to punish? And honestly, we need to ask ourselves, how much? How much punishment? So any decent philosophy will need to explain these and justify their answers um, before we can even um, accept it as any kind of good theory. A little more deeply philosophically, how do we even begin to justify punishment in the first place? Like what happened to turn the other cheek? Um, how do we distinguish the things that are crimes from non-crimes? Um, like, there's all kinds of little things I do that, like, definitely aren't good. Most of them aren't illegal, though, so. And there's a lot of things that I do that are legal that many people in this country think shouldn't be. So that's fun. But um, without some kind of philosophical underpinning of how we decide what's good and bad, I, we can't even start to be like, well, you did bad, now you need to be punished. So, the... We're given two kind of ideas here, the first being legal moralism. This is the idea that we criminalize, oops, sorry, did I just touch the microphone? Whatever. How, uh, legal moralism is the idea that we criminalize things that are immoral. So that kind of makes sense. We allow things that are good and moral and we punish things that are bad and immoral. This is a very, common sense kind of approach. It makes sense to a lot of people and it's very popular. Um, so what's good about this idea? As you read, ask yourself. But then also what problems does it have? Um, one that might spring to mind is who gets to decide what's immoral? There's lots of things that I think are immoral that are legal and there's lots of things that I think are moral that are illegal. So. How might that be a problem, and how do legal moralists respond to those problems? Um, the next one that we've got is the idea of the harm principle. Now this is one that was popularized by John Stuart Mill, the first of many philosopher names that you're going to need to learn. Um, spoiler alert, I think they're all old dead white guys. We'll see. But um, the harm principle is the idea 
that the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not sufficient warrant. So that sounds pretty good. Um, but I still have a couple questions. Why power? What is Mill talking about when he says power can be rightfully exercised? How does that tie into the definition of punishment that we're using that you read about earlier? Well, you may not have read about it yet, but that I was talking about earlier. So what power? Whose power? Um, power exercised in what kind of way? Um, but also, how does this approach to crime avoid the problems of moralism? And what new problems does it create? What do we base our laws on if not morality? Like, we still have to decide what's harm or bad. Like, so... Puzzle that one out. Now, this is just the introduction. So get a good taste for this in your mouth. Um, this is, that doesn't make any sense. I should cut that. Ugh. Play around with this, puzzle over it, and uh, see if you can answer the questions that I've posed here. I don't think I'm going to make an assignment about just this, um, but if you want one, let me know, and I'll come up with something. So read that, um, watch this video over again if you want to. I think you should. Uh, just to remind yourself of those questions, and I think that's it for now. Girl, that's plenty for now. So, I hope you enjoyed that, um, and if any of that stuff from the intro was stuff you weren't sure about or stuff you didn't get, please do email me, um, or we can do a Zoom meeting. Um, yeah. So, do go ahead and read chapter one, all about retributivism. It's, it's not that exciting, but I'm trying. I'm trying to make this exciting for y'all. And, um, man, if, if past me is actually going to, like, keep up that level of game, I kind of, I obviously need to do better. Wish me luck, and I will talk to y'all later. Bye.